Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Melissa Hosek, and I'm the adult programming librarian here at the East Brunswick Public Library. We're very excited to co-sponsor this evening's event. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Linda Lador, who is the programming co-chair of East Brunswick Chapter of Hadassah. Welcome and enjoy, everyone. Melissa, uh, uh, okay, so here we're ready to go. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Melissa Hosek, and the East Brunswick Library for co-sponsoring this event and realizing the importance, um, its importance in the national conversation. We all wish we could live in a kinder, gentler nation, but in truth, hate crimes abound. We need to pay attention. <clears throat> recently, the FBI data, uh, recently released FBI data showed that in 2021, Roughly 65% of hate crime victims were targeted because of race, ethnicity, and ancestry, with about two thirds due to bias against blacks, 14% against whites, 6% against Hispanics, and 4.3 against Asian Americans. Incidents related to sexual orientation and gender identity or about 20% of all incidents. Incidents related to religion accounted for approximately 14%. Anti-Jewish incidents were about 32%. Anti-Sikh incidents were about 21%. Anti-Islamic incidents, 9.5%. Anti-Catholic incidents, 6.1%. Anti-Eastern Orthodox, about six and a half percent. When it comes to the Holocaust, a recent uh, American Jewish Committee public opinion survey found that there is ignorance about how many Jews were actually killed in the Holocaust, and also ignorance about how Hitler came to power. In a 2020 survey of millennials and uh, Gen Z, um, conducted by the Material Claims uh, Committee against Germany, 56% of respondents were unable to identify Auschwitz-Birkenau, and there was virtually no awareness of concentration camps and ghettos overall, and ignorance as well of how many people were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and in addition, to quote further, uh, in perhaps one of the most disturbing revelations of the, the survey, 11% of all uh, United States millennial and gener Generation Z respondents believed Jews caused the Holocaust. The findings were even more disturbing in New York State, where an astounding 19% of respondents felt Jews caused the Holocaust. Also troubling is the percentage of millennials and, and Gen Z respond, respondents that have witnessed Holocaust denial or distortion on social media, approximately half. Against this backdrop, we are here to hear the firsthand account of Holocaust survivor Tova Friedman, as detailed in her memoir, The Daughter, the Daughter of Auschwitz who from the age of two in 1941, experienced the, the um, deprivations and violence of ghetto life, subsequent life in a Nazi labor camp, and ultimately arrival at Auschwitz, Birkenau at the age of five and liberation at the age of six in January of, of 1945. As we pause to take a collective deep breath, we might ask at this point, what kind of life could someone like Tova possibly have? Could any shred of humanity possibly be left? In her story of resilience, survival, and hope, Tova details her surprising journey. Tova earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from Brooklyn College, an MA in black literature from CUNY, and an MA in social work from Rutgers. 
She taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She was the director of Jewish Family Service in Somerset and Warren counties. Now 84 and still a force of nature, Tova continues to work as a therapist and speaks on her experience in the Holocaust. Tova was married to Meir of blessed memory who passed away several years ago. She has four children and eight grandchildren. Tova's memoir, The Daughter of Auschwitz, My Story of Resilience, Survival and Hope is available on bookshop.org or Amazon. We are truly privileged to hear Tova speak tonight and share her experiences and wisdom. Tova will speak for about 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. And please put your, your questions in the chat. Thank you, Tova. Thank you very much. I am really privileged to be here. I've been a member of Hadassah for who knows, thousands of years, and I have a life membership. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, those numbers are extremely disturbing to me because, you know, Auschwitz was in our lifetime. That is, it's, it's, it's in the lifetime of many of us. And it's, it's not like it's history of 500 years ago. And yet it happened, let's say, 80 years ago, and people have, are getting to forget. Forgetting is very, very dangerous because, as somebody said, if we forget and we don't see the, the, uh, the horrendous uh, effect of Holocaust and hatred, it, it, it may happen again. Uh, we look at this terrible uh, earthquake right now. Millions of people are hurt, displaced, dead. But that's an act of God. We don't know, act of nature. We can't prevent it. But we can prevent what human beings do to human beings. That we can prevent. We can prevent floods. Uh, we can't prevent uh, a, a, a earthquake, but but we can prevent what we do to each other. And I spend a lot of my time talking about it. Let me tell you, uh, I'm going to start from the almost from the beginning. Uh, and I want you to know something. My story is not just my story, or it wouldn't be that important. My story has to be duplicated by at least a million and a half children who were murdered, starved, drowned, shot for only one reason. They were Jewish and they were children. Children were useless because children couldn't work. The first thing that this big German uh, uh, army did this gigantic German army with all its planes and, and, and all its weapons was to target the elderly. The elderly means anybody over 50 were killed almost immediately the moment the Germans entered our town. And then the children. In my town, there were 15,000 Jew, uh, Jews. It was it wasn't a, it wasn't a small town. It was about 40, 50,000 people and 15,000 were Jews and they lived there for generations. There were hundreds of children at the end of the war in 1945. There were 200 Jews left. 200 Jews came back from Auschwitz. They survived. And out of hundreds of children, because who knows, maybe even thousands, because the families were very large, um, five, five children survived. I am, I am the youngest. I am the fifth, the fifth child. One of them lives in Germany, so I don't know her well. One is still left. She lives in Boston, but she doesn't talk anymore about the Holocaust. She's. Uh, almost 90. So I am left. I am one of the last people to represent an entire Jewish community. 
And I feel it's a very big responsibility. And I do it as much and often as people want to hear. My mother lost 150 people of her immediate family. She was the only survivor of a gigantic Hasidic family. And she died very early at age 45 because she did not want to continue to live. Um, my father lost also his entire family. Three sisters survived. One was killed after the war with the, with the, uh, by the uh, Polish anti-Semites who were roaming at that time, all the different towns. And killing those Jews, they made it through Auschwitz, but they couldn't make it through some of the Polish gangs. My memories uh, is very, very sharp, and I'll tell you why. My mother spent a lot of time talking to me while it was going on, not later on so much, while it was going on. Her parenting style was that if I know what's going on, that I'll be able to save myself. That was her whole purpose. She knew that eventually we'll be separated and I'll be a child of my own. And if I don't know what's going on, I don't know how to behave, I'll be shot. So each time something happened, she talked to me. And, and my, my, my uh, education started very early. I was two or three years old in, when we lived in a ghetto. These kind of ghettos were in every single Jewish town. They were duplicated. There were hundreds of ghettos, as many towns, unless the town was liquidated and taken immediately to a concentration camp and there was nobody left. But if there was a town with Jews, there was a ghetto. So we were all to, uh, living in a very tight places. And all I remember is that I was under the table. You know, there are many reasons. One, it was safe because they would come in. The Germans would come in this before the concentration camps, before the concentration camp, before the gassing. They, shooting was as common as going for a walk. You saw a child, you saw a person you didn't like, you shot them. Um, so I lived there under the table. I ate there. There was also no space, no, pl no place to sit, no place to lie down. And I felt safe there. But I do remember voices, you know, how you know people's feet. My grandmother, my mother's mother was taken out and shot. Then my father came in one day and he said to my mother in Yiddish, he spoke in Yiddish, I just took them on it on a uh, truck. I knew that was. Now, by then I was about four, four and a half. And my mother did not try to cover it up. She didn't protect me. She wanted me to hear it. He said, I put them on a truck. And he had tears. It's one of the few times I saw him cry. He, he an able-bodied man. He must have been late 20s, maybe early 30s. But I think he was like eight, uh, uh, late, tw it was late 20s. He, he had dug the graves for his parents. That's another thing. You see the way you degrade people? Look how you can, how can you kill six million people? It has to be a plan. And the plan has to be solid. And you know, this is what's so painful to me and so hard for me to understand. They weren't simple people. They were in the intellectuals of, of Germany. They were the professors. They were the, 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 the PhDs, the doctors, the lawyers, the, they were, they, they, they were high echelon. They were, they were the bums. The bums did the, did the, the killing maybe, but, but the plan was made by brilliant people. So this is what they did. They used us, our, uh, us, the Jews to kill Jews. To, to do all the dirty work. So it's interesting, you know, when um, at, at, at the Nuremberg trials, I, I, don't, I, I don't know all the details. I was, I, I couldn't even listen to that at that time. I was a teenager. Um, 
when there were when some of the Germans were asked, did you kill any Jews? They said, of course not. When they gave the orders, they themselves did not have blood on their hands. We had to do the work. So my father dug it, dug the graves and they shot them. They fell into the graves that see elderly people, all of them. And then it's people like my father who would have to take the bodies and bury them in a Jewish cemetery. There was a cemetery there. So his hands were the blood, not, 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 not the Germans. And the same thing with children. So in the beginning of the ghetto, all the elderly were killed. That means we didn't have the, 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 the uh, structure of a society. They broke up the family. Family keeps people together. Family is many, many families are a community. Many communities are a nation and so forth. That's the first thing they did. They broke up the, the structure that held us together. All our grandparents were killed. All our intellectuals, our doctors, our lawyers, our rabbis, our teachers, our doctors. I had an uncle, Uncle James, I always talk about him. He was about 22, 23, married to my aunt. She was only 17. It was a very, people got married very young, especially when the war was beginning. Everybody tried to get together. They were so, you know, just do some bonding, not to be alone. And he came from Germany, a German Jew, and he thought, oh, he's an intellectual. He was a lawyer and he could speak German. So he went and he, he, he volunteered to be a translator. He thought he will save the family or maybe get an extra piece of bread he was shot right away just by asking, just by going and telling them that I will be, I will be your translator. Shot. So the ghetto was abandoned by all the people who could be of any help. And the and one of the other things that was, I, I'm just amazed even to this day that I think about it, of the of the uh if you want to save bullets and starve the people there must have been some genius nutritionist who knew how much to give so you could live a week two weeks a month so that you could save a bullet and you don't have to take them to concentration camp they will die in place so there the ghetto the starvation began absolutely terrible starvation and uh, the hygiene, you know, everybody living together, no doctors, illnesses, had terrible typhus breakup, typhus and dysentery. So here people went again. They were, they, they, sometimes they didn't even lift a gun or a bullet. They just, we just died from, from, from just being in place, not eating, not sleeping, very little food and terrible diseases. And then there were a lot of orphan, orphan kids running around because their parents had died. There are many stories about how the ghetto functioned and I can't go into all of this because I also don't remember since I had my own little life. But in my life, people were disappearing. My father said, you're not gonna see your uncle anymore. You're not gonna see your grandparents anymore. <clears throat> and I never knew, met my mother's brothers and sisters because they were taken to a different ghetto. That's another thing, they separated people. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were less and less and less and less people in the ghetto because there were selections. Each ghetto was destined to go to a certain concentration camp. There was also a, a plan. Our ghetto, Tomashov Mazovetsky, was the name of the town was state was destined to go to Treblinka. That's where they went. So, so the, 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 uh, 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 trains went straight to Treblinka and some of us who stayed behind stayed for a purpose. The purpose, we were the cleanup squad. I still remember to this day, how, how most people were like, were like, uh, there were shootings, okay? The way they chose people, they didn't even have to choose people. They took us all out outside, 
we we sat on the ground i remember my mother had me on her lap and she was holding me extremely extremely tightly and the shooting began whoever was left alive was left alive these others the bodies were buried somewhere the rest of the people were taken to Treblinka. 36 people were left we were among them and my mother said to my father oh they're going to kill us now our job is done but they didn't they took us to the next camp in a truck the next camp was a real labor camp it wasn't it was a ghetto but it was labor they worked my parents worked every single day from about um to from 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 dusk to dawn to from to dawn to dusk early in the morning they went and, and and came back at night on trucks and i never knew they'll come back because uh there was some kind of a um they worked with some kind of powder um a, an explosive powder that if you inhaled it something happened to your body and many many people didn't even come back from the factory you know the survival of the fittest whoever came back came back and this camp like all the others they had the selections they they happened periodically this one this 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 street will be will be killed this week this street this week it was a complete plan because throughout the entire war uh, i saw them holding clipboards there were clipboards i never saw a clipboard before but i could see the checking off until there were very few people left and the hunger was absolutely you know people sometimes ask me if can i talk about hunger i really it, it's not describable it's something that you can and at that time i was five and a half five and i was roaming the streets on my own and my mother was worried she was gone the whole day. I was a five-year-old child running around the streets. There were very few kids. I could have stayed in the barracks if I want, but I was frightened to death. I didn't want to be by myself. So I'd run around with the boys. There must have been maybe a, two dozen kids. Everybody else had been killed before that. And, and uh, she taught me, she said like this, if you ever see a German coming towards you, go to the side don't look at him no eye contact throughout the entire war i had no eye contact with any german soldiers she told me eye contact means death eye contact he will notice you he will see you he will he will recognize you and and, and i knew what that meant at one time there was one woman who for some reason i don't know what happened uh, she 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 came across a German and she she looked at him and he looked at her. Well, there was a shooting that day. It was announced. My mother took me to the shooting, and she said, "This is what's going to happen if you don't behave in the right way. No eye contact. You have to give him the right of way. If you're wearing something like a hat or a kerchief, or you have to take it off, take your hands and put them in the back." Years later, I learned it's a slavery type of a look. But as a little five-year-old, oh, I knew. I knew because I saw the shooting. She pointed out. She said, you see, this is what happened. Again, she didn't protect me. And then one day, my father, I hear, they were supposed to go to work. But for some reason, they didn't. And I, re I remember him saying, save her. Uh, uh, what he, said, he said, hide her. There was the kids' selections. They had taken all the people who weren't great workers, the great workers stayed because they were the ones who were working in, in, in the ammunition factories. They were helping the Third Reich. They were, they were helping the Germans win the war. But those, they were, they were very few elderly already because they were killed before that. Very few children, but if somebody got sick, they couldn't go to the factory, he was shot. Very, very, very simply. Either he died in the factory, and by the way, I visited that factory, and there's this gigantic communal grave that that is with a little sign on it. These are the people who died in the factory. They just sweep the ground with them, you know, they just sweep them into the into this gigantic um um grave 
Now they were going to get rid of whatever children they were. So my parents found out and they, again, information, information was life. Information was almost important as bread. Information will tell you where to go, how to go, where to go, where to hide. And that's why my mother always talked to me. So I should have I, an idea and I shouldn't think that I'm living in a world that I'm looking at a shooting and she'll say it didn't happen. Yes, yes, it happened. So she picked me up I, I, and they put me, it was, they had a crawl space where we lived on, in, in a little room. And from that crawl space, uh, I looked out and I remember she put her hand on like this on, on my face and I had black and blue marks for, 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 for days. That's how tightly she held my, my mouth. She was afraid I would scream. I wouldn't have screamed. I'm not, you know, I, I, I just, I know I wouldn't have, but that's the end of the children. And I couldn't go on the street because they shouldn't see me. So for weeks, I was in a locked room without any kind of light. She shouldn't see anything. She covered the window and she told me never to go to the window. And that's how I stayed there. I knew exactly why and I behave accordingly. And all of a sudden she comes in one day in a daytime. She says, go out. You can now leave. I couldn't believe it. Beautiful weather. I walked out. It was just like sunshine and I've, I've been in the dark and I was so happy. She's, I said, oh, she's packing. W why are you packing? By then I am a f really five and a half, a little even more than five and a half. She says, oh, we're going to Auschwitz. You know, I knew the name, Majdanek, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Dachau. It was like words. You hear it all the time, but I didn't care. I was out. I was out in the sunshine. And I remember walking to the train. <laughs> And the first thing I saw in the train, my parents were separated. My father went, it was the same train, but my father went to the left with, with, with the men. We were, we were, we, we waited where we stood. We stood there and then she helped me up into the, 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 the train. The train was open, the door was open, but I saw the dogs. And I said to myself, the dogs have always been the most frightening thing to me to this day, by the way. I cannot touch a German shepherd. I have trouble with that. And and uh, the door closed. There were so many people. In the beginning, there were just a few. There were so many all new women that that uh, we we stood still. I I I learned later on it was thirty eight hours. I I didn't know I didn't know how many hours, but I I somebody told me how much it was how many hours. No food, no water. The worst thing, I couldn't go to the toilet. I kept saying, I want to go to the toilet. She couldn't hear me. It was so much noise. She was standing right next to me. But then I could smell. Everybody was going to the toilet where they stood. This and Terry, and I mean, so I so did I, so did I. And I remember sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 being sleepy. So I put my head on the person in front of me. Nobody even felt it. She was, she was wet from sweat. It was so hot until we, we arrived to Auschwitz. We arrived there and I want to do it quickly because in case you have questions, um, the noise and again, the light and the dogs. And I saw the dogs looking at me. I was exactly their height. And I said to my mom, they're going to kill me. She said, no, they won't because they only kill if you run. You're not going to run. No, of course I wouldn't run. And then she went she left me for about a few minutes. I don't know how long. She just walked away. I'm holding onto the suitcase. And she comes right back. She says, I saw your father. He's covered with boils. He's not staying in Auschwitz. He's going to Dachau, but he was tattooed already. Ah, oh, I knew. I heard about tattooed. I heard. I knew about Dachau. So I, I didn't know how far it was. I didn't know it was in Germany. But I knew he wasn't going to be with us. And then she says to me, get undressed. Well, I didn't hear the orders. They must have given, I guess, in German. I, I have no idea. And, and, and uh, maybe, maybe Polish. And then I said, why? Why should I get be naked? She said, you want to check if we're healthy. If we're not healthy, she pointed to the crematorium. You could see the smoke. And I said, what is the smell? She says, it's burning of the bodies. 
So, you know, five minutes off the train, I got the picture. I understood. I understood you have to be healthy. I understood that my father, I won't see my father anymore. He's gone somewhere. And I understood that in this place, they're burning bodies. Maybe I heard it before, but it, it didn't, it, 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 it didn't, um, I, I didn't really underst understand it until I saw the smoke. And after they look around, and I remember saying, am I okay? Am I okay? She said, yes, you're okay. Question, 99.9 .9 of kids my age were taken straight to the crematorium. I told you they wanted no children. Never found out why they didn't take their transport. Never found out. Somebody wrote a book, went to Rutgers here, and I read his book. And it said that this particular transport arrived on a Sunday. And the Germans had four crematorium going. And because it was Sunday, they didn't want to open up another one. They were like, it was their days of rest. Can you imagine? They were Christians. I don't know what kind of Christians these were. And 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 um, so I, I made it. And I guess they thought I will be going anyhow to Birken. I'm there. they would be on a barrack. How long will I make it? Most people didn't live more than two or three months. If you're lucky, if you're lucky. And then uh, they gave us back uh, some clothes, not my clothes, and they shaved my head. I remember standing on a bench and they took, took my braids and, and, and my hair and, and I couldn't find my mother because, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to, to see somebody without their hair. It's, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember the woman saying to me, your poor child, your poor child. I, I don't know if I felt poor or not, but I knew that I've got to find my mother, but I couldn't. She found there were lots of women, you know, this transport had thousands of people. They came from all over. Uh, on one side women, the other side men. Um, when, when, when she found me, she took my hand with other people, there were lots of people, and we walked into the barracks. I got a middle, ba a middle bunk, and again, the teaching started again. Listen, she said to me, you got to listen. You're going to get a bowl, a tin bowl and a spoon and a cup. You are never, ever to lose it. People steal it because if you, people, don't, the, guy, the people who give us the food don't care who you are. They don't see you. They only see the bowl. You don't have a bowl, you don't get food. So she taught me how to hide it a month and to watch it and, to, and I never lost it. I mean, right away. And then she said to me, you can't go to the bathroom, whatever you feel like it. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, you have to go when, we, when they take us. I said, what if I, can, what if I can't hold it in? What if I have to pee? She says, you will hold it in or you will die. I knew that right away. I have to hold it in. And I tell you, it, I was five, five and a half. And I kept thinking, how can I hold it in? But you know what? I did. It took us twice a day, in the morning and at night. And my mother gave me her piece of bread. She kept saying she's not feeling well, her stomach hurts. I was starving, a little piece of bread. We were online. We got this some kind of something, some kind of like a soup. She gave me her portion. And, and I said, but, but, but aren't you hungry? Oh, no, no, I can't eat. I'll get sick if I eat. So I was starving on two portions. Uh, those bathrooms was always a problem with me because they were, I don't know if anybody have gone to Auschwitz, but there is a, a replica of that, or maybe it's the original, I don't even know. But it's like a slab of wood, very long wood, goes across like a gigantic space, I don't know how many, 200 feet or more, gigantic holes. And in order for you to sit to go to the bathroom, you have to hold on. But I fell in. I was a little girl, I was five and a half. I fell in. And I remember my mom was trying to pick me up and she, other women tried to get me out and they hosed me, but I, the smell would never leave. It just, I, I, all over. <sighs> Many other things happened, but I just can't go. There's so much I can share with you. Uh, I got very sick. It must have been from something that I got from being in feces. The feces were at least 
up to my almost to my thighs at five and a half you know they cleaned up the the latrine i don't know how often but it was quite deep for a little girl and i, I was afraid to be sick i was afraid to share it because i know that sick means death i saw it. if somebody gets up in the morning and can't get out of bed out of that a bunk and it looks ill they took them away immediately i knew where they were going there was a special place for the sick and they kept them there until the guest chambers were free and they would take them oh i can't tell you this is really i okay i got scarlet fever the diphtheria my mother told me that uh, i didn't know the disease but i knew that i couldn't open up my mouth it was full of pus i couldn't see anything but i was afraid to tell her i was afraid that people will notice but they did and it took me away and i was put into a like a like a hospital but without doctors they just put me in close the door no medicine no doctors and i came out I have no memory of what happened inside there. I mean, because because uh, I had such high fever. I remember coming in. I remember all these women, it was for women only, women standing. Some of them had boils. They were screaming like that. They put me in the door closed, and the next thing I knew, the door opened. I, I, I did not know inside. I must have been very, very sick. And then I, I said, I want to go back to my mom, whoever I spoke to. She said, no, you can't anymore. She took me and she gave me a pair of white shoes and, with laces. And I didn't know how to put a pair of shoes. And I remember she said to me, a girl of five and a half should be able to put in a pair of shoes. Oh, a five and a half. I, I didn't know that. I didn't even know how I looked. I had no idea. But now somebody told me my age. She took me and she took me to the children's section. It was called the Tsigaina Lage. There they had taken the gypsies, I guess they call them Roma, but that's my memory is of gypsies, that, that word. They had just guessed 400,000 in a few days. The gypsies lived in families. They weren't separated. They had, you know, father, mother, children, grandchildren, whatever, all together. And they went all together to the crematorium, to the gas chambers, to the gas, all together. And now they had room for children. So they gathered children from all over. I was with my mother. Other people came from somewhere else. And they put us all together in this spot. And this spot was not far from Mangula. So when, uh, you know, Mangula, he did the experiments and twins. So when we went for a walk outside, the kids from the Mangala group told us what was going on. He's taking an eye from one person, from one child, and he's taking it to the other one. We knew nothing about anesthesia, but I, I, but they were telling us these stories. And, and, I, 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 and all I kept saying, oh, I'm so happy I'm not a twin. I'm not a twin. You see, kids talk. That's the funny part. It's, it's what my mother asked me years later, do I remember much? I said, no. I didn't want to hurt her. I didn't want her to know what I remember. And she said, oh, you're so lucky that you were a child. But I, I remembered so much, but I had to protect her. I didn't want her to know what, you know, what really was going on with me while she wasn't with me. What could I say? Oh, yeah. As, as, and, and upon the arrival to the kid, kid's place, they tattooed me. And I remember they told us all to line up. I thought lining up means food. So I fought for it. I wanted to be first. I wanted to be the one to get the food first. I didn't know it was, a, it was tattooing. But so I fought with this one girl that I knew from before. I knew from my hometown. She won because she was older. And I was annoyed the whole time online that she got ahead of me. So she got one number ahead of me. And, and um, when the woman tattooed me, she said to me, I'm going to give you a very neat number. You'll see a very neat. If you survive, you will buy a long sleeve shirt and you'll be, co you'll be, you'll be, uh, you'll cover it and nobody will know and you won't be ashamed. Thing is, I never 
realized what shame was and but I said okay okay and she and she gave me a a rag a wet rag and she said go very do it very keep it very very tightly so that it shouldn't it it shouldn't hurt don't rub and she taught me how to say the words 27,633 I didn't know what it was but I learned it very quickly she said what's your name no more she said that's not your name no forget your name this is your name say it again I didn't know what I was saying I didn't know seven eight not I didn't know numbers I didn't even know the numbers I didn't learn numbers till I was eight or nine years old I have a lot of trouble with numbers so so um and and I can't I want to go a little bit skipping because it's 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 a world that will take I mean I wrote a book that's how much you can describe this kind of a world one day they called us and they said um you're going to get great wonderful food I was delighted and I knew where we were going everybody knew because the barrack next door was empty and they had also a breakfast and they were gone we knew we were going to the crematorium there was a, we got this fab i didn't care i didn't care i wanted to eat i got them was oh, there was wet and warm it looked like the gray i don't know what it was it's sweet it was sweet with sugar it was the most delicious thing i, I can remember i mean all my life by then i was by the way six already i'll tell you about my sixth birthday and and so they 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 uh gave us this meal and we got dressed and we started walking to the crematory we knew i knew right away and uh, there were parents of uh, women screaming where are you going to the crematory and they started screaming i I'm, i remember saying to the people why are they so unhappy doesn't every child go to the every jewish child go to the crematory but we I have to tell you we stayed there for a while <clears throat> a whole we stayed there f a whole day I think we were freezing and we don't know what happened we don't know what happened they sent us back <coughs> excuse me and then I remember saying um my, oh the parents were still outside the mothers and they said what happened I could hear my name I never I haven't heard my name for months now I only know my number and I knew it was my mother and I said they'll get us next time well I want to go back just one time how I know my age I was six I got a little package and it was a little pack as a piece of bread inside a, a a bag it was a blue bag I put it inside my clothes I was going to keep it forever and in the middle and it said happy birthday it said sixth birthday I didn't couldn't read it it was in Polish and it was one of the uh, the people who the caretaker I mean the couple the woman they, they had different names for these people they were all Jewish by the way and I took it and I hid it from everybody I wanted to keep it forever and in the middle of the night gigantic rats came ate up my whole bread I didn't even taste it I didn't even taste it but I knew my age at least I knew that I was six about a few weeks after we we sort of escaped the gas chamber which I have no idea why um my mother shows up she looks absolutely dreadful and I'm not sure it's my mother but she talks to me talks to me she bends down and she says listen they the the Russians are coming and they want us all to walk you know the walk is so long she said to Germany we couldn't walk very far and she said there's snow outside you will survive she looked at me but I will die I will die on the walk and you know, she said, I don't want you to live by yourself in this kind of a world. This is not a world for children. By the way, she never had any more children. She thought it was not a, not a place for children. She said, will you die with me here in Auschwitz? Here, we're not going anywhere. I said, I will. I was so happy to be with her. We snuck out 
out of the barrack. It was easier then because it was chaos. The Germans were running and shooting and, and the woman who took, who took care of us was disappeared somewhere. And she found a hospital not far away. She, we walked in and she found a corpse that was just died because it was warm. She touched many women, all women, corpses. She said, climb in. I climbed in and she arranged my body in such a way that should be no trace that I'm there. And she had, she, she put the blanket up to here and the hands of the dead what was a very young woman, by the way, outside. And she said to me, you have to breathe in such a way that the blanket doesn't move. So she put my mouth in, and my mouth was, my, 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 my head was under the woman's uh, 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 armpit, but my face was facing the, the, uh, uh, the, the ground. And she disappeared. And she said, don't get uncovered no matter what happens. I knew how to, by, ne by then I could obey hundreds of rules. Rules were my staples. I knew what rules were. And I knew what it meant if you don't obey them. And she disappeared. And then I hear screaming and yelling and shooting. Germans are walking in, taking people, sick people out of bed. If the people don't get up, I, can, I hear shooting. And then somebody stops by my bed. And I stop, I stop breathing. I was just absolutely, and I don't know how long the person was there. Had it been longer, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, to keep my breath. But that person went away, was a German soldier. He went away to the next bed because he was convinced that the corpse that there was really dead. And then I was, then there was quiet and I smelled smoke and I came out. No, I, 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 I didn't, I'm sorry. I, I, I breathed in the smoke and I said to myself, I, I, I'm going to die from the smoke. But my mother said, do not get uncovered. But within two minutes, she came over, she uncovered me. And these are her words, they are gone. Just like that. That was January 25th, 1945. The Russians didn't arrive until 27. We had two days of being inside Auschwitz and the Russians haven't come yet. And that, that, that's how she saved me. She also was saved with a corpse. And when I set up, there were all these people throwing the corpses off their beds because there were many people hidden with corpses at that time. And that is sort of the most I can share with you, I would like to share more. Oh, oh, let me see. This is the book that I'm amazed. The Daughter of Auschwitz. This is in English. It's in many other languages. Um, I met somebody when I went to Auschwitz, a, a 75th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz. I met um, a reporter called um, Malcolm Brabant. He is a war correspondent for B, uh, PBS. And he said, he was his idea really. He said, let's write a book together. And it was COVID. So he was in England and I was here and neither of us went out of the house much and we couldn't visit. And we, we put it together, we wrote it together. So if you want to ask, there are lots of things that I just couldn't tell you because it just it it you know it had I have other incidents but it's very hard to explain what I tried to do and he was very helpful in this is to make it very visual because numbers are great six six million million and a half but the daily life and this you have to multiply by the other children. This I wasn't unique. They just weren't as lucky. They were they were in the wrong. They, had I come on a Monday or a Saturday, not on a Sunday, I wouldn't be here. 
just my transport came on a, on, on a Sunday. I didn't plan it. Nobody knew about that. It it just happened. Do you know? So so so, a lot of it is luck. So my parents' ingenuity also. They're teaching me how to behave. There's some other incidents that her teaching were very good for me, saved me. But other children just couldn't make it. So if you have any questions at all that I can help you, I'd love to hear them. Well, oh, that was an amazing and uh, powerful uh, presentation. Uh, our first question um, is, your mom was amazing. How did how did her parenting style impact how you raised your own children? <laughs> I wasn't a great mother. <laughs> mm. I'm a better grandmother. I learned. <laughs> because I kept telling my kids the truth. But we live in America. What do they have to know nonsense? I, when they said to me, let's play. I said, play? What do you want to play for? <laughs> They used to say to me, let's go to the mall. I said, the mall? <laughs> so my husband said, all right, I'll take them to the mall. You know, the American style of, of, of child raising, I couldn't get it. I didn't get it. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while. and But I, I did tell my kids the truth. I did my very, I never played. I never... Um, you know, as a child, that was very serious. I was very worried about my... When I was in America, by the way, in Brooklyn, I remember eating regular meal and I wanted a second helping. I was I, I didn't ask for it. I was afraid there wouldn't be enough. A, a different style. So when my kids, oh, they'll do this, they'll go that. Lucky my husband was an American and he could make up for my craziness. So they could go to the mall, they can go to the movies, they can have popcorn, they can do this stuff. I said, why don't you read War and Peace or something <laughs> like that? <You> know? <laughs> but my grandkids, I've learned already. Um, another question is from Cheryl. Have you connected with other survivors through the years for mutual support? Absolutely, absolutely. The five children. We look, we found each other. Mm -hmm. Not only do, uh, yeah, and, uh, and we met, not uh, four only, because the other one is in Germany. Uh, every uh, 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 November, January 27th, we all went together somewhere and we spent the weekend. No telephone, no husbands, no friends, just us. Talked about our lives, about our memories, mm -hmm. what we felt, how we took, you know, that's what I, I asked somebody, well, you got the tattoo. What did you think of the woman? She said, oh, her hands were shaking. I said, yes. And I said to her, yeah, I thought this lady doesn't want to do what she's doing. She's such a nice lady. And then she was killed. So there was just us. And we ate excellent food because food was our big thing. <laughs> yes. And another thing, <clears throat> you don't have the picture. You probably don't have it. Maybe I have it, just a second. I'm in a book and there's a picture that I want to show you. Oh, this is pretty big, this one. It's the liberation of the kids, of the, of the, of the Russians took that picture. You know, when they, in 1945, when they mm -hmm. saw us, this person, I don't know how to do this on this computer, it's the opposite. This person and this person I met, and we had a party together. She became the teacher of my children, Sarah. Wow. This one right here. So we were standing next to each other at Liberation, and we didn't know each other, but we met in New Jersey. Wow. From Rachel, how do you feel about descendants of Holocaust survivors getting their relatives' numbers tattooed on them for their, in their memory? I find there's something wrong with it. I don't know why. Why would they want to do it? By the way, there is a person that it's on uh, Facebook. 
my daughter, he tattooed this whole picture on his arm, a complete photograph of all the children showing their their numbers on his arm. Wow. I, I have a lot of, I mean, I understand the, the, I do understand the sentiment. I would maybe make a, make a, a, a photograph of it and frame it so I can remember. But, oh, by the way, I want to show you something else. This was the advantage of being home. This is what we got when we left. This is the Red Cross gave us to leave Auschwitz. So, so, so we, this is the original. So that uh, we don't look like vagabonds. And this was, this gave us free transportation to go back home. But I, I don't understand it. No, I, 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 I don't get it. Why anybody would want to do what Hitler did. Okay, we have um, Hugo from Paris, France, and he thanks you so much for the opportunity to hear you. And his question is, how come when arriving in Auschwitz, did you stay there instead of going directly to Birkenau gas chambers regarding your extreme age? That is, I never found out why. And, and, and the reporter who wrote with me is a, is a, is a researcher. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't find the answer. There were I, one reason is that I it was Birkenau, by the way. The play, the train arrived to Birkenau, not to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a mile away. And Auschwitz one. This is Auschwitz two. The Birkenau. The train came to Birkenau, and she's a hundred percent right. We were supposed to go straight. I don't know. I, I don't know. And, and I told you it's because they were, it was Sunday. There is another theory. They had just killed thousands and thousands of Hungarians. They had just murdered. There was no room. There was no room in the gas chambers. You see, they thought we would die anyhow. So it's today or tomorrow. It was, it, it, it's, it's absolute, to me, it's a miracle even to this day. Five to survive out of thousands and this was just the beginning there were other things i could have been shot any time we were stood on a pet okay never mind let let the people ask questions okay this one is from um barbara um what made it possible for you to become a therapist and hear the problems of others oh well i have well i became a therapist as an older woman. I was 40, uh, already a mother with four kids because I lived in Israel before that and taught at the Hebrew University. I somehow have this idea that I like to leave this place better than I found it. I don't know how. Talking isn't enough. I can talk, okay. But to do something. You know, I had a client, not Jewish, who heard about me a few years ago. You know what she said to me, which is very interesting. She said to me, Tova, I just figured out why you were saved. I said, how, why did you? So you can save me. <laughs> That's a very touching thing. That means I do something for other people. And you know what? Pain is pain. And Sometimes things are even worse, like you deal with incest or other terrible things. Pain is pain. This question is from Donna. How did you meet your husband and, and what year did you come to the United States? I met my husband a few weeks after arrival to America. He bought me a sandwich. That was it. Anybody who buys me a sandwich, I'll marry. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And he spoke Yiddish. What can be better to a little girl from it? I just came from a DP camp, by the way, this place people's camp, because we had no place to go. So it's a whole story after that. So he said to me, let me buy you a cheese sandwich. He was, tw he was uh, 13, I was 12. I said, really? He said, yeah. And, 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 and in Yiddish, he said it. Okay, I came home, I said, 
I just met my a boy I'm going to marry. My father thought I was crazy. And in, in, in 1950 came to America. I was 11, I was 11 and a half. 12, almost 12. Here's a question from Dor. You are a delight. I am thankful that you are here. How do you keep such an upbeat, effusive personality? <laughs> you don't see me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you something. What's the point? Uh, I, uh, one of my uh, Michigas crazinesses is that I wanted to undo what Hitler did. And then since I was a little girl, how can I undo it? How can I undo it? How can I? So first I had a, four kids. I wanted six, one for each million. But somehow we both decided four was a pretty good number. And then I don't want to survive. I want to thrive. I want to be just, he wanted me dead. I will live. He wants me hungry. I'll eat the best foods, uh, you know. He wanted to, to to kill Judaism. I study Judaism to this day, by the way, every single day. Every day I have a class in Judaism. I wanted to undo it. And part of it is my nature. I'm not going to, I'm going to let this happen. I'm not going to. Uh, this is a question from Rita. Thank you for your amazing story. When did you arrive in the United States? 1950s, uh, April 4th, to be exact. Mm -hmm. This is from Pamela. When you went back to your hometown, how were you treated by the townspeople? Terrible. The worst. The Poles were the worst. They said to me, and to my mother, what are you doing here? We thought Hitler killed you all. We had no place to live. They were the worst. And in school, they called me dirty Jew, and they said I killed hit. I, I I killed Jesus. I remember coming home to my mother and said, "Somebody says I killed somebody. Who is Jesus?" You know, I didn't have any education of anything. I said I killed somebody. I don't even know them. Terrible. And I didn't go to school. I refused to go to school. I didn't go to school till I was at this place. People came. I must have been eight years old. I wouldn't go for the two years that we lived in Poland. How does your uh, memory of your experience change over time? Do some things become more important? Yeah, it's a very good question. Yes, yes. As I have a large, not a large family, but you know, and I see them squabbling or something, my heart hurts terribly. Much more now than when I was younger, because I said, my mother lost not even a cousin. What wonderful thing it is to have a family. Mm -hmm. And here my grandkids are squabbling over this and squabbling over that. And, 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 and why did he do this? And, and my one son says, I'm not coming to her dinner because she didn't call me early enough. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I said, be happy you have each other. That's what's very painful to me. Um, it's a very good question, you know. I thought, I've been thinking about it a lot. How important it is to keep us together. Mm -hmm. You know, family, friends, community, things you care about. Because in one second, it all can disappear. Look what happened. Look what happened now in, in Turkey. I mean, can you imagine if somebody had a fight with each other and the next day they, one of them died? I mean, we should sort of live. Maybe it's a cliche, and I never usually use cliches as if every day is our last. You know, I call my one kid in college, a uh, uh, grandkid, and I call, did you speak to him who's in a different college? What should I call him? Because he's your brother. Mm -hmm. So what? You know what I'm saying? That's a good question. Tell this person I appreciated that question. Um, from Beatrice, from B, have you ever participated in the March of the Living? No, but my two grandkids have. 
one is going next week or two weeks from now and another one i have a somebody opened up a trust in my name and he put quite a bit of money into it for the march of the living and any teenager in that area wants to go gets a 50 percent scholarship from that trust mm -hmm. because it's expensive okay Who helped you from Barbara? Who helped you settle here in the United States? I don't think anybody. We came. My father was very resourceful. He had a job within three weeks. And we moved into a little apartment in Queens. And I did exactly what the woman in Auschwitz told me. I got a long sleeve shirt. And I didn't talk about the Holocaust. And I didn't talk about my number. I remember what you said to me. And by the way, the teacher in eighth grade agreed with her. She once saw my number and she said, I told her what it is. She says, cover it up. Don't, don't talk to anybody about it. And, and then we moved to Brooklyn with a lot of refugees a lot of new immigrants. So it, it, it was a very, very healthy relationships, very, very good environment for me. Did you experience anti-Semitism in, in the United States? No, Rachel? I'm very lucky, but I'm very, very upset with what's going on right now. And I really want to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me speak to my grandchildren about it because they'll see it on campus no i personally if you live in new jersey and new york and brooklyn there isn't too much anti-semitism around from jill how did you and your mom reconnect with your dad oh that's another good question we went back to poland <clears throat> to our hometown, and so did my father. Everybody who stayed alive, everybody who was alive, um, came back to hometown. Do you know what I mean? It was as if an unwritten contract, as if to say, as if to say, I'm coming back to the place where I saw you last alive. And my mother, we waited two years, two and a half years, to see who came back. Nobody from my mother's family came back. And my father came back from Dachau. Um, another question about anti-Semitism from Kim. How do you feel about the rising of um, anti-Semitism that is rearing up today in the States? Very, very scary. I'll tell you what's so scary about it. I spoke at a college they didn't have a single Jew. The person who invited me was half Jewish and he was a big guy on campus. He was a ball player. So he said he wanted, and he saw the anti-Semitism and, 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 and somehow the, uh, the powers there, the president agreed. So he said to me, you know, we don't have any Jews here except me and I'm a half, half Jew. I don't know, mother or father was Jewish. And yet we have an anti-Semitic parade. It's shocking. I don't know what it is. I, I don't really, I don't understand why all, oh, you know what it is? It's Israel. The, the people don't like what's happening in Israel or that Israel is so strong or so they started on the Jews. They had to have some excuse. Mm -hmm. How did your um, experience as a um, survivor uh, contribute to your um, your skill as a therapist? Difficult to say. Uh, I I feel that you know my attitude is that we are all more resilient than we think we are. And when somebody will come to me and say, I can't do it, I can't handle it. And so I say, yes, you can. Yes, you can. 
you can and you will, and this will pass, and you'll be okay again. And I'm not talking if it's an illness, I'm not a medical doctor, but emotional. I said, you know, you'll get, you will bear it and you will be okay. I think that type of, I have that kind of an attitude towards troubles. Mm -hmm. um, do people have more questions? If uh, people can ask more questions and if not, I'll just read um, some of the, the um, comments people have made. There's one question here. Um, okay. If people tell, told you to cover your number and not talk about it, how did you decide to start sharing your story? Well, uh, I always felt, well, I when I was about 12, somebody, want, a doctor wanted to take it off for me. So I should not remember that anymore. And I wouldn't. I really felt I have to tell somebody. And when my kids were in high school, my oldest daughter in high school, she told her teacher that I was a Holocaust survivor and I started talking. I was quite old, mm -hmm. my fifties. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, I didn't talk about it before. In fact, you know, when this book came out, I had a friend from Brooklyn. We knew each other at the age of 17. He said, we were together. We did everything together. He said, we were, we went to the beach. We had parties. Why did you never tell me anything? How come you, how, how, how come I'm finding out now, 60 or 70 years later? I never talked about it. Uh, a question from Hugo. How do you feel about having um, gone through all of this? I feel I have an obligation. I have an obligation. My obligation to let other people know about it. I don't know if it'll pre help prevent. I really don't know. I speak to, oh, well, let me tell you something interesting. My grandson put me on TikTok. He's a 17 year old, so he likes TikTok. I never even heard of it, but he likes that. And what's interesting is that we got hundreds of questions. That means kids are listening. So I feel that it's my job to tell it. I don't know if it'll help. I don't know what else. To, what can any of us do against anti-Semitism? I'm just trying to tell, I, I don't know if they will listen, that if we continue hating each other for color, for different sex, for different uh, religion, for different ideas you know it's okay to not like each other i don't have to like you i've learned nothing about you but i can't kill you and i can't promote that kind of talk so I, I, that's what i'm trying to do I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say if you're going to keep on if you're going to allow to 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 get rid of people who aren't like you that could be this that could be an end result How often do you have flashbacks? Uh, lately, a little too much mm. because I talk a lot. I dream a lot about it. A lot of it is running away and, and so forth. It's, it's um, for, year, for years has been dormant, but um, now that I talk about it, it comes out a little bit more, more often. Did you take your family to Poland? Did you take them to the Holocaust programs? Oh, I took them to Auschwitz. And I have two sets of twins. And I took them to Mengele to show them what they did with twins. Mm -hmm. I didn't protect them, just like my mother didn't protect me. Mm -hmm. They have to know. They can't live in, you know, they, you can't think that their house is the world. And we lived in in Israel a lot, so mm -hmm. my my children know a lot about Israel. We all speak Hebrew, mm -hmm. and so forth. But my grandchildren, 
are very part of this culture. How did your children and grandchildren handle hearing about your um, um, oh, about your story? Well, you yeah. know, they lived, they were born with it. Mm -hmm. Because the first time when a two and a half year old would say to me, why did, no, let's say three year old, why did you write something on your hand, on your arm? You're not supposed to use a pencil mm -hmm. on your hand. I say, I didn't do it. Somebody else did it. Who? Bad people. And that's the end of it. Wow. And then slowly as they get older, as they get older, they learn, they learn as they are able to understand. But they always knew it. When uh, when did you go to Israel and why did you go? When did you live in Israel and why did you go? Oh, I lived in Jerusalem. I taught at the Hebrew University. I went there before the Six Day War. It looks like I miss wars. I like to be. I was in sixty seven war. I was in seventy three war. You know, I'm comfortable with wars. So <laughs> I live. I came back ten years later. Uh, it was it was more, it was economic. It, nothing i'd love it i absolutely loved living there but it was, it was economic issues were you ever contacted by the shower project to tell your story yes i did yes a long time ago yeah were your parents more or less religious after leaving the camps oh no 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 my mother who lost such orthodox family or oh, she just didn't want to live anymore so she died at 45 and she talked about it a lot and we were kosher i think more out of habit and she kept everything but she had no belief she never went to shul or anything my father kept his and i have my own she was the one who just right you know she couldn't understand why the most orthodox were killed first which is true by the way all the Hasidim were killed right away. Wow. Because they were the most visible. Uh -uh. A related question is how, how were you able to keep your faith and connection to Judaism after? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Much, much. I don't know how much faith I have. I have a lot of problems with God. You know, Yom Kippur, I go to Shul. And when I, when the section comes that, all these sins that he has to forgive me all the sins i always have a pact with him i'll tell you what i see um i i tell you i first have to forgive you and then maybe you could forgive me and i haven't forgiven you yet so sort of weird You described how much your mother's influence, uh, how much, you described much about your mother's influence. How was your father when you reunited with him? Well, my father was always different in a way. The way he saved us during the war, he knew, he was the one who knew the information. He was the information person. Mm -hmm. And my father wanted to go back to life as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't remember him being depressed. Mm -hmm. he, he, three of his sisters survived. One was killed. And, you know, he wanted to really go back to life. As, he was a singer and an actor. He loved acting. And he was a tailor. He made money by being a tailor. But his, his thing was theater. And he was, um, but my mother couldn't. couldn't. So, and after my mother died, he remarried about a year later, a wonderful, wonderful woman. He just, he just felt he had this life force, which she didn't have. She had it during the war and then she just gave up. What was the first thing you did upon liberation? Eat. <laughs> Eat. um do the five children who who also survived speak out about their story as you do uh no one could not speak she couldn't it was too much for her and she committed suicide 
uh, five years ago. She was in her 70s or eight, I don't know exactly her age. She's a year younger than, uh, a year older than I was. I just don't remember the year exactly. She guessed herself, would you believe it? She, uh, she couldn't talk. She just couldn't. Uh, the others did. The others did talk as much as they could, yeah. And one, and one of them, uh, her son wrote a book, a wonderful book called The Tailors of Tomashov, because there were a lot of tailors there. Mm -hmm. So he described the city and, and the whole occupation, and he talked about his mother. Mm -hmm. um, we're close to running out of time. Um, um, do you know, um, do you know anyone who was saved by Oscar Schindler? And what do you think of his story? No, I don't know. Oh, I, I, I must have met people by Schindler. In my, I think it's um, Hollywood. You know, I mean, it's good. It's it, it, Look, I don't know if anybody can do better. There's no way to describe. I can't describe. What I said to you is, you know how much I describe? A quarter. Mm -hmm. I don't have the words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when they took the people who were sick and they took them out and put them on, on like a, I don't know what you call these things, like a push cart or something. They were like half alive in order to gas them. You can't describe that. You know, you can't just, when, when one of my, one of my bunk mates died in the middle of the night from starvation, I knew that she was going to die. A hundred percent I knew. I could, I kids were so, kids are very smart. Kids are smarter than we think they are. Uh, they, they, I, I knew that how much, I didn't know how much time, I didn't know timing. But I said, she's going to die soon. I could see all the signs of, of, of starvation. And she did. Or one kid would say to another kid, I saw your parents. And the usually a younger to an older, an older child to a younger child. And the young child would say, no, you didn't. You don't know me. You don't know what city I'm from. Come, I'll show you. And he takes them to the window and you see the smoke. And he says, these are your parents. You know? We knew, we knew everything. I think the, the last question uh, we could take is from Rachel. How do you feel about the Jews who survived the Holocaust that denounced Judaism or claim there is no God or if there was a God, he would not let it happen? You know, it's uh, can't judge them. You really can't judge them. I once went to a conference where child survivors, where I asked the, the people who organized it if we could have a Shabbat service. Now they have it. There used to be a time where they did not have a Shabbat service. So they, but we didn't have any prayer books because we weren't prepared. We were in some city. I don't know which what city we were in because they have these in different cities around the country. And I said, okay, I'm going. I can't, I don't know things by heart. I know a little bit. So I'll be there. So everybody said, nobody's coming. Nobody believes in God. They were all traif. They're not kosher, those conferences. You know, and I'm kosher, so it was hard for me. But, but um, be before an hour passed, there were 50 people there who said they don't believe in God. And the God is horrible. And they cried and they said, where, were, where was God when my per parents were burning? In other words, how can you be angry at a God you don't believe in? You have to believe in God if you're angry at them, at, at him. And, and, I, and those people who, don't, who say they don't believe in God, they, as their, their anger is so deep. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be so angry if they didn't believe in God, because who, who, who are you angry at? I mean, I don't know, with this, with this um, um, what's happening now, you know, uh, with all these people are, di are dying right now, with the, with the, with the um, 
uh, what's happening in Turkey? Who, 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 who are going to get angry at God? Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's anger at something is always a belief in something. So Tova, I'm just going to read um, a few of the comments from people that really, um, uh, that I'm sure all of us feel. Uh, this one is for Deborah. Thank you for sharing this incredible presentation. I am so grateful to have been a listening member. I am very moved and so appreciate this bravery and candor. Thank you. And um, there's another one from Barbara. Thank you for, so much for sharing your story with us. I've heard you speak at Young, Young Israel of East Brunswick, but it's always inspirational to hear from you. Thank you. I saw somebody said God had nothing to do with it. Maybe yes, maybe no. We don't know that. I know people say God gave us free will. I don't know. It's 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 philosophical. I I really don't know. I know you know. There's this wonderful uh, movie. I think it's called The Quarrel. Are you familiar with it? No. The Quarrel. Two two friends who were in yeshiva together before the war, and all went through terrible situations, and they met again. They survived, and they met after the war. And one is ultra orthodox, and the other one believes in nothing. Started the same place together. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, it was. It's, it's fascinating if you can get a hold of it called the quarrel, because it, each one has a reason why they chose that path. Is it an American movie or an Israeli movie? Uh, no, oh, gee, it must be an American movie. Yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah, just we'll, look it up. The quarrel. We'll we'll look for that. Um, so, um, Tova, it's really um, very very incredible to hear you speak. I read your book, and um, there's nothing like hearing hearing your story from your own lips. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Would you like to uh, say something in closing? Melissa. Okay. <laughs> Great. Tova, your story is so important. And it's one we don't always hear. It's very important right now. Thank with you. With everything going through the world. So thank you for your time and sharing your story with us and writing it down. So the uh, the title again is um, The Daughter of Auschwitz, My Story of Resilience, Survival, and, um, and Hope. And... Um, this um, the recording will be available on the um, the uh, East Brunswick Public Library YouTube channel. I just want to thank you for helping me. You know, you're part of the solution in a way because you're the ones who help people hear this. I couldn't do it on my own, so thank you for enabling it. And thank you uh, for all the uh, 204 people who tuned in. <laughs> thank you so so much. Thank you very much.